everybody. We're ready to roll in another chapter of Matthew. And uh, it's exciting to me to be in chapter 22. Um, I, before I get started in the chapter, I want to make sure that we understand some things. And this is something that's very precious to me. It's very profound to me. And that is the understanding of kingdom. Um, we talk about kingdom. And obviously when we're I mean, I, I, even to be close and be able to look at the painting here and, and to see it up close and see the detail and uh, the various things that we know are represented, are, are the gifting that God puts inside of people to do uh, and interpret and bring revelation is just, we use the word awesome. Uh, just put it in all caps, if you would. I, I just think it's incredible. But I believe that the word of God is that awesome also as it unveils what somebody can put in painting. There's to be a revelation in our minds about what this looks like and how this comes forth. And that's what builds passion on the inside of us because we're trying to walk out in a kingdom that's invisible to most of the world and yet very visible to us and becoming more visible. And so today we're going to start in Matthew chapter 22. But before we get there, I want to I'm going to stretch myself and write on this board that Kyle has used so efficiently, but I want to talk to you about kingdom. Um, because in, um, in the understanding of kingdom, uh, it's, it's really an unrealized um, part of our life because we don't consider ourselves as people of a kingdom. But I, I would like to define some things for you. I have actually written some curriculum for some of my own study and, uh, and it's just called Kingdom Principles. And this is something that I've studied simply because when, when you look at what John the Baptist uh, preached, the, the, the kingdom is coming. And, and, and if there's going to be a kingdom coming, he's preaching the gospel, not just of Jesus Christ, but the gospel of the kingdom. And so with that, we need to understand what a kingdom is. So let me just write down a few things that I believe is, is kingdom. First of all, uh, every kingdom has to have a defined territory. Anytime that you're looking at uh, naming something as kingdom, there has to be territory involved because this is the part that uh, defines where things, uh, the boundaries of where these things are going to apply. The next thing you're going to find out is that every kingdom has to have a government. In this case, if you're talking about a kingdom, you pretty well have to have a king. So realizing that we're unveiling a kingdom, then you are obviously going to look at, well, then who is the king? Well, in chapter 22, we're going to get very close to that. But there are a number of other things that we really don't understand. If there's going to be territory and if there's going to be government, there has to be laws. And if there are laws, there actually has to be law enforcement. And we, went, we understand this uh, in spiritual kingdom. I mean, if you talk about Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That's not our fight. But we do fight against principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. We recognize that we fight and there is a, uh, a conflict in this and that there has to be law and there has to be law enforcement. And that's where in this kingdom that is all spirit, there has to be boundaries, there has to be law enforcement. I also want to say this, in every kingdom, there is actually a language. Um, and so if, if we define these things, and, and I'm not going to be able to do this today, but what I'm, what I'm after with these things is that we would recognize that we look past just the idea of kingdom understanding, and we start looking to say, what does the kingdom of God look like? What does it sound like? Where are its boundaries? How does it work? Because all of these things matter to us. And that's why if we understand what kingdom uh, boundaries look like, it actually sets the place of authority. And we are to learn as citizens of the kingdom of God what authority looks like and where the boundaries of that authority are. So we've got language. We've actually got other things here. There's currency. But, but the beauty of this is, is that if you'd look through and you'd start saying, okay, so if in our kingdom, so to speak, the United States of America, we've got defined territory. Well, what's one of our big issues that we're facing in this day? 
Are we going to enforce the boundaries of our territory? Well, if you don't, you're actually allowing your laws then to have less effect because now you're not defining your territory and you can't hold people accountable. So when it, what ends up happening? You get into a chaotic state because now we don't know where enforcement is. Well, I want to tell you, there, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven defines its territory, defines its authority by the word of God and by the other subjects here. The word of God unveils the laws of God. Therefore, we have the understanding of who is involved and what happens. You've got law enforcement. There's the consequence of sin, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. You've got all of these uh, understandings that come with it. What is language in the kingdom? And there's, there's, there's so many ways to inspect it. What is the currency of the kingdom? Just for a little highlight, let me just tell you what I think, okay? I believe that the currency of the kingdom is time. And what we get to do here, and God gives us a period of time that we who are on earth, we are going to use the, the allotted time given to us to see how we're going to be stewards of what he gives to us. So what we do is, he allows us certain areas. He, he tells us we are to work. We, we know that there are jobs and things like that. But what he allows us to do is take some of kingdom currency, turn it into the currency of this world by spending time. And often we're paid by the hour. And, and so you have the specified understanding of this. But what happens is, we love turning more of his currency into more of this currency, and, and we, we end up turning our lifestyles into something that sometimes we can't even afford, but it tells us a little bit what our heart is, because he's saying, I have been kind and generous in giving you this amount of time, but what would happen if you'd use the rest of that time for my kingdom instead of trying to turn it into a place where you end up serving yourself or, I mean, even go further than that, you know, people who get into heavy debt, what are you actually doing? You're selling off time you haven't yet lived because now you're going to have to turn that currency into the currency of this kingdom in order to do what you have to do. Why? Because I wanted it now. And so when you look at the principles of kingdom and you see what is here, you, you can understand why it matters that, that God um, gives us a specific time and he says, you can't serve God and mammon. So now I, I would like to come in. There's other things that I could add here. I believe there's, there's culture to every kingdom. And I think that there's also an overall attitude to every kingdom. And so that will be the extent of what I'll put on the board. But I, I hope that I can um, give you a, a sense through Matthew's, especially the first part of Matthew chapter 22, of some of these kinds of things. So uh, as we get started in uh, Matthew chapter 22, and we start in verse one, and it says, and Jesus answered and spoke unto them again by parables. And this is what he said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king who made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. I'm gonna ask you a question, and I can ask you guys the question. This guy is a, he's representing the kingdom of heaven, but he's a king, and he's gonna invite people to the wedding. Where do you suppose the people he's gonna to invite to the wedding are from? His kingdom. You see, it would make sense that they're in his authority base, so he would expect them to recognize his kingship. That's where, I think this is really clear, and this is one of those areas that, you know, again, he knows where he's at, he knows what his audience is, he knows that in the middle of all this are the Jewish people, but there's, there's the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and, and you've got all of these crowds around, and he's speaking some of these things out. And, and he goes on to say this, and again, he sent forth other servants. I'm sorry, let's go back. I don't think I finished that other one. Uh, I want to make sure that I, we understand. He sent forth his servants to call them that they were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Now we'll go on. And again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding or the marriage. Who's doing all the work for this thing? The king? The, yeah, he, 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 the king has done all the preparation, 
All he's doing is going, there's going to be a royal wedding. We've seen that happen. We see, you know, when especially Great Britain and England have their royal weddings, all of our national news broadcasts go there and they love to broadcast all the pomp and all the beauty and, and the majesty of it. We don't even get that here. I mean, we wait for presidents to die and then we get a big procession. But over there, the weddings, the royal weddings, it gives you a better idea of kingdom because this is actually our kingdom and therefore this matters to us because this is gonna be an authority structure to us. This king is sending out invitations and saying, please come and recognize my son is getting married. And so as we go on, it says, and they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. What do you suppose it means to say they made light of it? Guys, what do you see? I think they just disregarded it. Okay. They, they obviously didn't take it seriously. Okay. It's like, eh, I got no time for that. What does that really reflect? Their heart. Towards? The king. There we go. It reflects their heart towards the king. So when you're looking at this, what they're not, what they're not taking serious or what they're really reflecting on is between his ways and his desires, and where they went. Where does it say they went? It went? They went their ways. One to his farm, and another to his business, his merchandise. And we'll, we'll go on to the next verse. And the rest of his servants, and the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully, misused them terribly, and then killed them, slew them. And then it goes on to talk about, and when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, he was angry and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their cities. Okay, so what we have is it would seem like he sent his servants to call them. They wouldn't come. He sent his servants again and they wouldn't listen to them, made light of them. And so they, they destroyed them. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to say this carefully and um, trust their editing. Um, there, there is... It's easy to see what has happened here in twice going and then having uh, someone die. And, and so you, you look at this and you're going, okay, who, who would have first been sent? And they said, All right, I'm not listening to them. And the second time they're sent and they go, eh, I'm not listening to them. And then they, they send the servants back and they, make, they entreat them bad and, and then kill them. And we're looking at this and going, what does this represent? Could it be the very thing that when you're talking the Mount of Transfiguration, we had a Moses and an Elijah, and you look at that and you're going, we've sent you the ways of God, we've sent you the law, we've sent you the prophets. They witnessed that you're going to come into this wedding feast, and yet they're not coming, they're not believing it. When I, when I see this, this passage, and then again, I, I look at this, we would like to think that a crown like this would, would be solid, that it would be gold, that it would be beautiful. And yet just as this painting is, this is a suffering king. This is a king who there is a real crown involved, but if you can see that painting well, there's the, the crown of thorns that is mixed in with this. And, and it's just like what uh, these, these guys have been talking about in the last couple days. You know, when you're talking about um, the sons of Zebedee and, and the mom coming and, and saying, are you, uh, are you able to drink of his cup? And I want them to sit on thrones and, and one on the right hand and one on the left. And then I believe it was Tom that brought out that here's, here's the cross and here's one on the right and here's one on the left. And, and you're going, wow, that's, that's quite a throne. That's quite a king. And yet what was the name that was put up over at the top of the cross? Even they wrote it. He's the king of the Jews. The only ones that didn't recognize it were the Jews. And so when you look at this and you see the, the analogies and, and how clear this is, and then you see how the king was absolutely mad and he sent his armies and, and cut off basically the ability for them to come to the wedding and called them their murderers and burned their city. Let's go to verse eight. It says, then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they that were bidden were not worthy. In the sense of worthiness, 
what we're looking at, and it says they were not worthy, but I, I want to turn this into the understanding of what worthy would mean, and we're going to get there in just a couple more lines here. But when you see that they were not worthy, what they had measured was their own worth compared to his worth, but what the king had measured was what they compared worth was valued at, and so he measured their worthiness for the wedding by how much they valued the worth of the king. Does that make sense to you? I hope so. Uh, what, what I'm after here is we look at, you know, if I'm invited to a royal wedding, I would probably frame the invitation. I would probably look at the various articles of it. I would make sure that there was pictures of me, selfies with wherever I was going to be. I would have all of these things engineered so I can say, I was there, I was there. And yet here's a king that's invited all of, you know, most of his kingdom, and they're not even wanting to come. And so now he considers them unworthy because they have not measured what it's worth to the king and to the allegiance to the king. So now let's go on to the next verses. Here's what he tells him again now. Go ye therefore into the highways, and we know this from other passages too, and as many as ye shall find, anybody that you can find, bid them to come to the marriage. Next one. So those servants went out into the highways, gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. In other words, here comes the whole idea of whosoever. When you come into this place, there's a wedding. The intended guests decided this wasn't worth it. We've got things we're doing. We've already got our stage set. We're not coming to the wedding. So they went out and said, whoever wants to come to a wedding, all you have to do is come. All that you have to, everything's ready. Just come. And they invited anybody, and even to the point where it says in Matthew's version that it was bad and good. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, friend, you remember Tom talking about friend? This is that place in Matthew chapter 22 that he said, friend, how camest thou in, into here, into this wedding, not having a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. You've heard in the last few videos that you've watched, the rich young ruler you heard the sons of Zebedee vying for, you know, the, the right hand and left hand. You've, you've heard various things that talked about how, um, how the kingdom of God is associated, and yet what, this is almost like that upside-down kingdom. He who's going to be first, they'll be last, all, all these kinds of things. And then he says, how do you come in here without a wedding garment? And he says, he had nothing to say. My point is this. We have the ability to know that he, we've been invited to a wedding. He's not necessarily a wedding crasher. He's invited. Sure. We invited everybody. But the idea is, the whole idea of worthiness that was the, the disclaimer on the first group, when we come into this one, this man now comes in and the king says, why did you come in and you're not dressed for a wedding? You didn't know this was a wedding? And it says the man was speechless. Let's go on. Then said the king to his servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away. Cast him into outer darkness where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. I've heard this verse used in all kinds of situations. I know that it can be misused in some applications also. But I, I, I want us to understand what if you're going to look at many are called, and it says many are invited, and that word is kletos, that, that it would mean that many have received an invitation, and then, but it's going to say, but few actually respond. Few are actually going to come and accept the invitation because the invitation has been sent. Who will ever come, they will be considered those. That word uh, is actually a word that you would, might know, that, those, that group that's put together there. Would you like to know what that little Greek word is? It's um, eklektos. 
Are you familiar with the word eclectic? It means that you have a group that's made up of various components. It's a group that wouldn't naturally necessarily fit together. They call them kind of an eclectic group. And it means that you're not sure exactly how they got put together. Many are called, but there's only a group and it's an eclectic group that would be those who are put together in that way. When I look at this and I, and I see what was written in the, if you would go back to verse 13, it says that they bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you're going to put this whole wedding scenario together, I don't think it's that difficult to see what our scenario is and how you find the king. The idea of kingship and what is meant to be kingdom understanding, we have over here that there would be a territory, a government, which would be the king and the laws of the kingdom and the law enforcement. This is what I believe this has a lot to do with in the sense that if you want the benefits of the kingdom, wouldn't you follow the dictates of the king? Wouldn't you be interested in the very things that the king is offering to the subject, so to speak, in a kingdom? And therefore, when you have this understanding, for whose benefit are all of these things in a kingdom? They're for us. We, we, we get the benefits. We understand that there's an army that, that, that patrols and keeps our territory. We understand that there's a government and, and it's meant to have laws and law enforcement, but law enforcement for our good as citizens. We understand that there's a common language together and there's a common currency and we can have an economy together. We can walk these things out. And yet what we're taking, what we're finding in this passage is everybody wants to do their own thing. Everybody wants to have it in their way, in their time. They want to self-serve and go to their farm and to their business. And you've heard this from several of the last chapters and you realize that you're marching down the path to the cross. And Jesus is trying to build the intensity to say, do you understand what a kingdom looks like? Do we understand how this is going to play out and, and what, what we need to have as an understanding of who we actually serve in a kingdom? The king is the object in the kingdom because only when the king is in his right place. You know, it used to be in the old times that when the king was out of the country, they took the flag down. It meant that the king had moved out and, and now there was not the, the understanding that he was in the castle. But the, the idea of that the king is in the house and that we're invited to his place, this is something that I think should, should show us the desire of the king to say, look, I've handed out the invitations. Everybody is invited, but it's only those who are going to be willing to come and be dressed are going to be the ones who will enjoy the beauty of my son's wedding. I do want to go a little further into this chapter, and I'm going to leave that part for now, because down in verse 23, it says this, The same day came to, him, came to him the Sadducees, and they asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased or died, and having no issue, no children, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, all the way to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died too. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Now, I, I, I want to just... They didn't come in here just to say, okay, uh, Jesus, we really have a serious question about heaven or we have a serious question about the king. No, they come in to see if they could entangle him. He says, you do err. Not only do you not understand the scriptures, you don't understand the power of God. You don't understand that God can do absolutely more than you can ask or even think. And so as he sees this to them, let's go on because this is the beautiful part. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And one more, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, this is fascinating to me because now he's going right to the heart of who these people are. They're the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So are they just dead? Are they just gone? If they are gone forever, what's the beauty of being their heritage? 
And yet what Jesus is saying, these are alive. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. But you're cutting off your own seed if you don't believe that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are living and still have a plan. They're part of the plan that's coming on. And he says, so are you going to believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Or is that just going to be nothing to you? And when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Don't you love it? This is, this is awesome church. <laughs> when they shut up that group, we got active. <laughs> then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Of these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them and said, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? You like who's asking the questions now? And they say unto him, he's the son of David. Psalm chapter 110, verse 1 the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now, if you'll notice, again, this is King James, but in King James, you can look at a couple people, a couple things. You see that first Lord? Is it spelled the exact same way as the second Lord? No, it's not because the first Lord is Yehovah. The second Lord is another word, Aum. And that way, when you talk about the king and his son and you see what it is, here's a perfect example. And Jesus is walking them right back into the scriptures and showing them why this is something that should make sense to them. And yet they're going to choke on their own food, so to speak, when they're saying, who do you think is the Christ? They're, 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 he's going to say, well, is he going to be the Messiah? Is he going to be? No, he said he's the son of David. How can he be the son of David? If David's the one that said in spirit, he called him Lord. And this is the idea that David was actually prophesying something that was way over the head of these Pharisees who are supposed to know the scriptures. And they're the ones looking at this. And what does it say they could do? They couldn't answer anything. They couldn't say a word about it because they knew that Jesus had just spoken right into them themselves. Why? Because this whole passage had been about these religious people who wouldn't accept the king because they already had their own ways. They already had their business. They already had their farm and they weren't going to come to somebody else's wedding because it takes them out of their position. When we come to the place where our position causes us not to follow the edicts of the king, then we're the ones who sit in jeopardy and we're the ones who will be judged for it and it will be a terrible judgment that comes. Let's make sure that we do hear the voice of the Spirit. Let's make sure that our King is the King. Let's make sure that God is the one who can speak into our lives and we say, yes, sir. Thank you, King. You are my King and I love it that way. Hope you receive this. God bless you.